is Mark Media. Hit it! Welcome to Gunshots Straight from the Hip. I'm your host, Mark Gunn. The views expressed on this program are those of the host and guests and not necessarily reflective of anyone or any entity associated with this broadcast. This episode is brought to you by the Centers for Disease Control. The best way to protect yourself from 2019 novel coronavirus is to avoid being exposed to the virus. Additionally, there are preventative actions that you can take to protect yourself and your family from the spread of respiratory viruses that can make you sick. These include stay home if you're sick, cover your cough, and wash your hands. For more information, visit coronavirus.gov. That's coronavirus.gov. This episode, Songs from the Studio Chair, My Life in Music. In this episode, I'm going to share some stories about how I got into producing music and the recording of some of the biggest songs in the field. You'll also find out how the song Human Nature was inspired by a five-year-old. I'll also tell you the story about one of the most important lessons that Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis learned from Prince. And did you know that Michael Jackson's Beat It almost did not make it to Thriller? For most of my 58 years, music has been a major part of my life. It began with a dad, a multi-instrumentalist, who put me behind my first drum kit at the age of five. He also exposed me to many different genres of music. R&B, jazz, rock, and country, just to name a few. It was because of my dad that I started paying attention to the session musicians on various projects. I also found that I had a talent as a singer, which my mother strongly encouraged. To hear her tell it, I'd sing everything from TV theme songs to commercial jingles. I would also embarrass her by doing it in the middle of the grocery store. Now, one of my first public appearances also proved to be one of my earliest lessons about failure. I was in the first or second grade when we were in the middle of some sort of school recital. Can't remember exactly what it was. I had a solo vocal, and I remember blowing a line. I was instantly upset and almost ran off stage. I stayed and finished the song with the rest of my group, and the lesson I learned was to always push forward no matter what. As I got older and being a child of the 70s, I discovered that I could learn the lyrics to a song and sing it note for note within just a few listens. Back then, if you could sing, you stood a really good chance of being popular with the girls, a tradition that carried over from the doo-wop days of the 50s and 60s. I, like many kids my age, was a huge Jackson 5 fan, so those were the songs that I tended to learn more than any others. While I never wanted to sound like Michael Jackson, I always wanted to sound as good as he did. I was also turned on to the rock group Chicago, which would come to play a major part of my musical upbringing. Over the next few years, I played drums in a couple of high school bands and sang in the concert choir at my alma mater, Baker High School in Columbus, Georgia. It was there that I learned the finer points of music arrangement. I also found my true strength as a singer. I performed with some of the most gifted artists I'd ever been around, some of whom have gone on to have careers in the musical field. During my senior year, I was asked to audition as the lead vocalist for a local cover band called Cargo, an eight-piece band with a horn section made up of high school students from various schools across the city. We even had a special effects manager at the time. Totally unheard of for kids, right? Now, this was the first place where my Chicago influences came into play, because any time we covered one of their songs, I pretty much taught the band the vocal arrangements. We covered a lot of the hits from that time period— Boston, Led Zeppelin, The Jacksons, Sheik, and so many others. Cargo had three major milestones as a unit. We were one of the first bands outside of the heavy metal genre to be invited to perform at an annual outdoor summer concert thrown by a local promoter. We did a 30-minute set, which included Boston, Wild Cherry, Rod Stewart, and quite a few others. That was the first time in my life that I had ever been asked for an autograph. Being 16 at the time, that was mind-blowing. The second milestone was winning an annual Battle of the Bands competition. Our lead guitarist, Donald Johnson, was a veteran of a couple of other bands, and he had the idea of us moving like a special forces unit. On the day of the audition, we were to wear some form of black pants and a white shirt. 
We loaded our instruments on stage in a quick and organized fashion, and when it was time for the producer of the show to talk to the bands, we walked off stage, single file, and lined up on one of the front rows of the auditorium. With a head nod from him, we all sat down at the same time. There was a quiet that went through that room right then and there that told us that we'd already won before the actual battle even began. Our set consisted of two songs, an Earth, Wind & Fire instrumental that segued into Shake Your Body Down by the Jacksons. Now, if you can remember the live video that they did, we also did the choreography of that song. And remember our effects guy? Well, we have these old-school flash pots on stage that went off whenever I pointed to them. My mother just happened to be in the audience that night, and to this day will tell you that she was in shock and didn't know who that child was on stage that looked like her son. I still laugh about it. To contrast our performance, the band that followed us was called the Flintstones. Yeah, the Flintstones. And to say that they were low-tech, even for the 70s, would be an understatement. So instead of the flash pots that we had, these guys had pieces of sulfur paper attached to various parts of their instruments. At different points during their performance, one of their members would walk around on stage with a lighter, lighting the paper. I ended up feeling really bad for them. Oh, oh, by the way, we ended up winning the battle. Our third milestone involved me missing my senior prom. Sort of. Unbeknownst to me, quite a few of our classmates had seen Cargo during our live performances and wanted us to be the band at that year's senior prom. Now, I was blown away by the request, and I took it to the band. They agreed, and we took the gig. We had a great night, and my coolness quotient (laughs) increased significantly. This was also around the time when I got my first gig in what would go on to be my career for over 30 years, radio. So imagine a 16-year-old lead vocalist of a popular local band becoming a radio personality all before getting his diploma. Cargo ended up breaking up as some of us went off to college and real life got in the way. Now this is where music and media for me intercepted. And I began flexing my muscles as a songwriter. Now, Don had been writing songs that he didn't have any lyrics or melody for. So we began collaborating and recording. He'd record the rhythm tracks, and I would take them to the radio station and record and mix the vocals. Now, this was my first taste of producing music. We ended up with four or five songs on what, in hindsight, was a pretty crappy demo. The songs were decent, but the overall quality of the production... It just wasn't there. Coming up, how did my time in radio end up with me being in the recording studio? I'll also tell you how Michael Jackson's human nature was inspired by a five-year-old right after this. We know that we're asking Americans to do a lot right now. So we're asking everyone to be selfless for others so that we can protect those who are most susceptible to this virus. A question I often get asked is why should young people care about the spread of coronavirus? Well, we know that people with underlying medical conditions over the age of 60 are at highest risk, but they've got to get it from somebody. Social distancing is really physical separation of people. It's what we refer to when we ask people to stay at least six feet apart. Not going to bars, not going to restaurants, not going to theaters where there are a lot of people. It all just means physical separation so that you have a space between you and others who might actually be infected or infect you. We all have a role to play in preventing person-to-person spread of this disease, which can be deadly for vulnerable groups. For more information on how you can social distance, please go to coronavirus.gov. For downloads of this and past episodes and information about all the multimedia services we offer, log on to our website at www.markgunmedia.com. That's markgunmedia.com. Welcome back to Gunshots Straight from the Hip. We're taking a nostalgic look at my career in music, and I'm sharing some behind-the-scenes stories about some of the biggest hits in the recording industry. So I was talking about the first demo I ever recorded and produced with my former cargo bandmate, Donald Johnson, and how my radio career got me into recording music. Now, one of the things I've always prided myself on when it came to radio and audio production was in taking the same disciplined approach I used in music. Everything I did was planned to a degree that whatever I imagined, I could bring to reality. 
I called it painting pictures with sound. I've also been able to use my musical ability to create parody songs as a morning show host. This is Arca Media. Hit it! Beans, good for your heart. Beans, the kind that make you fart. Beans, let your butt cheeks part. Beans will knock you down. <laughs> What you talking about, homie? Boy, you need a hug, What you saying there, tell me? You know what halitosis is? Now break it down for me. Damn, it's a two-minute game. Huh? What you saying to me? Your breath is hot, your breath is hot. Your breath is hot, your breath is hot. You need a breath, man. Your breath is hot, your breath is hot. Your breath is hot, your breath is hot. Yo, man, wipe your nose. You got one bad habit. You know what? I've had it. You think that it's cool, I suppose. Sticking your finger up your nose. I hate the way you work it. Quit digging, G. Your finger up your nose. I hate the way you work it. Quit digging, G. No matter where you go. I hate the way you work it. Girl, I can't eat your food. Don't Really lost his mind now. Super freak. The kind of dude you read about. The girl he took his crack pipe. And that's why she got beat. He'll be locked up for a long time. Fresh meat. His free was too tight. His free was too tight. His words were too tight. Over the last four decades, radio has taken me all over the country, but it was in two places where I started making my way into various recording studios, San Francisco and Los Angeles. One of my closest friends in the business is Bay Area rapper Paris. He gave me the opportunity to hear music from an album he was working on, which would become The Devil Made Me Do It. He was actually one of the very first artists to ask my opinion of his material from a musician's standpoint. I'd find out years later that I'd developed a reputation for being very knowledgeable when it comes to what makes a hit record. In fact, I've got several gold and platinum plaques as a testament to that. One of my biggest thrills was an interview I did with two of my producing heroes, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis of the time, at what was KSOL. They were promoting the very first Sounds of Blackness project and had several members of the group in the studio with us. Their hit single was Optimistic, and I was playing it in the middle of our interview. I decided I was going to show off my skills as an engineer by having the group sing along with the song, and as it was fading, I'd bring up their vocals. Now, the audio board we used had the ability to pan the mics to left and right, so you'd hear some voices on the left side and other voices on the right side, and then there were the ones that were already in the center mix. I gave Jam and Lewis headphones so that they could hear what I was doing, and at one point, I started directing the choir. The smiles on their faces when all was said and done told me everything. As producers, they had their humble beginnings as members of the time, and they talked about a very important lesson they learned from their mentor, Prince. Yeah, we'd always say, Prince, why don't you go groove with your own band? (laughs) But our group, we were funkier. So whenever Prince wanted to work something out, he had in his head he'd come with our band as he'd come over and he'd start jamming and we'd all start jamming and then back in that day was a cassette and all of a sudden somebody would press record on the cassette and then we'd play for an hour or something then we'd walk out Prince would pop out the cassette and the next day we'd hear something very similar to what it was we jammed on you know and so it got to the point where Prince would walk into to rehearsal he'd start jamming and we'd all kind of go 
yeah, I think I'm gonna get some need. Uh, I think I'm gonna, you know, we'd be like, because we were like, or or I'd be noodling around on the keyboard, and then he'd go, Jimmy Jam, what's that? You're what you're playing, Jimmy Jam? What are you playing? <laughs> nothing, Prince. Nothing, man. Just trying to get a sound up, you know, just nothing. But Prince, I, I tell you, the, the work ethic story is funny. I could almost demonstrate it. Maybe let's see. Let's see. Is this up? So we're just playing seven 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 ninety three eleven, right? Here is my lesson. So I'm at rehearsal, and we're playing the song. Because all I needed to do on 777 was just do a, a bass line. That's all I would do. And we get done with the song, and Prince goes, Jimmy Jam, what are you doing with your right hand? <laughs> I said, I'm not doing anything, Prince. I'm just I'm copying the bass line of the song. You should play the chords that Monty's playing. I said, Monty's already playing the chords, but you got to play the chords because it makes it bigger. It should sound better than the record. That was his thing. Better than the record. Okay, so now I'm playing... So I'm thinking, okay, cool. Now, all right, I can do that. No worries. Jimmy Jam, what note are you singing on the course? <laughs> I'm not singing a part, Prince. It's like a three-part harmony. Terry's got his, and, you know, I think Jesse's singing, and Morris. It's, that's it. Find a note and sing. It's got to be bigger <laughs> than the record. <laughs> so now I'm... Seven, 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 three. All right. So I'm, now I'm like, okay, cool. I can, I can hit my note. I can play both my parts. I'm good. Jimmy Jam, how come you're not doing the choreography? <laughs> Prince, I'm standing at a keyboard, man. I, what choreography? <laughs> choreography is simple. You should be able to do the choreography. <laughs> now, I'm up there playing, and now I'm trying to hit the little choreography, you know, and I'm trying to hit my guitar, and I'm seven, 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 and I'm so frustrated. I'm just like, ugh. Crazy. So we practice and practice and practice and practice. I'm so pissed off. So the very next day, come back to practice. There's Prince. 777. Seven, seven. Let's hear 777-9311. Okay. And we come in and we come. 777-9311. Seven, 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 <laughs> so the point of the story is, I'm now, not only can I do all of those things, I can take my hanky off, I can tip my hat, I can peek over my glasses, I can put my hand in my pocket when I'm not playing. And, and the thing was, is that that taught me, it's like, you can do a whole lot of stuff you don't even know you can do, but you need to work at it. And I thank Prince for that every single day, because I never, he saw something in me that I didn't see. He's like, why can't you do it? And I'm going, I can't do that, Prince. And it got to be a habit on, on all of the songs, you know. Yeah. Whatever he told us to do, we'd always then reach for the next thing. To this day, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis are two of the most prolific songwriters and producers in the business. And it was estimated at one point that they had made enough money just on royalties that they could retire and never set foot in another recording studio. A few years later, I moved to Los Angeles, and that's when all of the pieces of my musical life fell into place. As the music director of a radio station in the second largest market in the country, you're the gatekeeper as to which music gets played. And you also have the kind of access to record companies that folks would kill for. I ended up meeting a lot of the session players that were my heroes growing up. A lot of those relationships I still have to this day. One of my favorite memories was spending an afternoon with LL Cool J, listening to an upcoming album that had yet to be mixed. The cool thing about that was that we talked about it from both the radio aspect, you know, which songs could be possible hits, and the records aspect, the more technical aspects of the production of the overall project. One of the biggest influences in my life as a musician and producer is Quincy Jones. I've been listening to and learning from him ever since I was a child. Now, he talked about his approach to producing a record. It starts with two things. It starts with love and then trust. Those two things are the components, the, the real components of what make it happen. After that, everything bounces off of that. If the cover's messed up, the tempo's too slow, or too fast, or wrong key, and wrong musicians, and wrong engineer, and da da it's the producer's fault. But if it's a hit, it's the artist did it all. It's natural to want to say, I did it all. That's human nature, I understand that. It doesn't bother me either. It's, there's so many elements. You have to know, when, when you mess with people like Ray Charles and Frank Sinatra or, or somebody like that, and you're telling them to jump without a net, man, you better know what you're talking about. The priority is to know the artist. Is that, that's where love comes in. 
Because if you love an artist, you take the time and the patience and the, and the initiative to know everything about them. How, do, how are they in this register? How are they in this register? How high do they sing? How low do they sing? Uh, how many more takes can they handle? Is it time to take a break and just, just have some fun? Or is it time to push them for three more takes? And you better know what you're talking about because it, I've seen some, some incredible encounters go down when a, a, the producer doesn't understand the artist. And, and the artists don't play. The artists will let you know how they feel real quick, you know. Q also adds, There's two things in our business, a song and a story. And I, I discovered this 45 years ago. You've got a great song. It can make the worst singer in the world sound great. If you got a bad song, the three best singers in the world can't make it work. And I've heard that too. And his wisdom would serve me during a project that I'll talk about shortly. One of my favorite things about living in Los Angeles and being what I classify myself as a lab rat is the six degrees of separation thing that the music community seems to have. It wasn't unusual for me to run into a musician that to you may not be a household name, but to folks like me were gods when it came to studio sessions. So it wasn't out of the ordinary for me to run into, say, a Paul Jackson, who's a brilliant guitarist who played on hundreds of albums. He's also done work with another musical hero of mine, Steve Lukather, lead guitarist for the group Toto. Again, you may not know the name, but chances are that in addition to the Toto projects, he's played on at least 30% of your music collection. In fact, he and Paul recorded some of the sessions for Michael Jackson's Thriller, and that was because of their relationship with Quincy Jones. Remember that whole Six Degrees thing? However, did you know that the song Beat It almost didn't make the album? Luke explains. I had done the Dude record with Quincy. David Foster introduced me to him. And I was like 22, 23 years old. After we did that, uh, he came up to me at the, and said, Look, man, I'm going to do the next Michael record. And it was coming off off the wall. So I want you to play on some of this Michael Jackson. I was like, oh, this is going to be one of the biggest records. Okay, cool. I'm there. I'm all in. That beat it came because it was weird. They had cut a version of it prior to this, and they wanted Eddie Van Halen, and Ed and I are dear friends, and we have been. We were friends even back then, and he didn't do sessions or nothing like that. They had cut a version of it, and Ed, and, they, and, they, and these are the days when they had two 24-track machines they used to make slave tapes. You know, you make one and they copy, so you can do a bunch more overdoors at the end. They put it all together in two reels and you mix. That was really high-tech stuff for 1982. And we were using that stuff in our, on our records as well. And Eddie, I guess, cut the two-inch tape, and he wanted to edit and play the solo somewhere else. He wanted to play through the verse change, so he had something to play off, some changes to play off. Well, when you cut the Simpty code, it doesn't lock back up. So what they did was... Eddie's solo and Michael's lead vocal and Michael hitting two and four on a drum case and the Simpty Cove were on the master reel because Ed had cut the slave tape. They transferred that to the, somehow, and then they needed to recut the track to the saver stuff. There wasn't drum machines. There wasn't a click track on it at all. Just Michael, bop, 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 which is still on the record. And so Quincy goes, you've got to save me. You and Jeff go over there and see if you can fix this for me. I got to have it. It's first generation vocal, first generation Van Halen solo. You got to make this work for me so I can sync up the track with the fresh tape that hadn't been cut. So they sent it over. We listen, we can, and there, you, know, you can hear it bleed through in the lead vocal mic. So you got, kind of got an idea what was going on. Jeff having perf the time that he had in his profession. I mean, one of the most magical human beings on planet Earth that I ever got to know and play with and be a brother. And so Jeff went out and with his sticks listened to that had it cranked in the phones and he made his own click track just the way he wanted to hear it and he went out he goes okay he got a drum sound up quick and he went out there and he did a couple takes I think the second take was nailed his time was perfect it was great he nailed it so it was my turn so it was like okay Eddie's playing on it so I got like the Marshalls and I and I played the guitar riff first the da 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 and we quadrupled and made it big and I, there was no bass on it so I said bring me down a bass and I'll play the bass on this and so I did all that we sent it to Quincy he goes I love it except the guitars are too heavy I gotta get this on R&B radio pop radio and rock radio he goes don't quadruple just do two so I can get it like that so I did that 
They loved it. And then Quincy goes, come on down with Michael. We're going to do some. He wants to add a couple of these other riffs, which the da 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 and that's all they had. And, I, and that was just so monotonous. I said, why don't we do it da 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 to give it something a little different flavor. And at first they were a little hesitant, and Michael was like, I like that. So they wanted me to do this part, and they're standing there, and I did it a couple of times, and Quincy's like, it's not really in the pocket, you know, lay in the pocket a little bit more. And Michael gave me a couple little bit of directions and stuff like that, try it again. And I started doing it, and Michael started dancing around a little bit. I knew I was, I think Quincy's like, that's, that's great. Let's double that part, and blah, blah, blah. And that's the record. And then they mixed it. I think uh, it might have been Steve Picard, Greg Filling is the made that synth sound bow, at the beginning of it that you never hear again anywhere in the song. And the rest is the rest. Okay, so I know he was given a little inside baseball stuff, so I'll try to explain it, okay? You heard him mention the SMPTE code. Now that stands for the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers. Long story short, the SMPTE time code is basically a timestamp that allows producers to edit a project accurately. Now, what Steve was referring to when he talked about the tape being cut was that if they tried to use it as it was, the timing of the entire track would be thrown off because of the way that the tape was cut. It was offbeat. Now, because of this, Steve and drummer Jeff Procaro had to recreate the entire rhythm track to beat it. So what you hear is Toto playing with Michael Jackson. Now, one of the other huge hits from Thriller was supposed to be on the Toto 4 album. Now, that was the one that gave us Rosanna and all the other hits that won them a Grammy Award that year. Human nature being on Thriller was actually a fluke. Steve Percaro, the guy who wrote it, explains how it happened. I had been working on the Thriller album already. I'm doing synthesizer work on the album. So I'd already been, was in the studio working with Michael and Quincy. He'd been asking David Page the other keyboard player in Toto for songs. David was known as a great songwriter, and he'd been asking him for a, a certain kind of song he was looking for on the album, and he would send an assistant over every day to pick up whatever grooves David was working on. And uh, I had just written Human Nature and just finished the demo, and I had made a cassette, just a stereo mix of the cassette. David called down to me one day. I was living at his house at the time, and he said, uh, Quincy's assistant's coming over to pick up those two grooves I was working on last night, make a cassette for me, would you? I said, sure. And I went down, and sure enough, we were completely out of cassettes. So I took that cassette that I just made of my song, Human Nature, and I changed the labels. I fast-forwarded it, and I recorded David's stuff on the A side so that it was the first thing you would hear when you put in the cassette. My song was on the other side of the tape, and I never thought Quincy would ever hear it. The story goes, according to Quincy, that he listened to David's two things... And he just happened to let the cassette player roll, keep going. And he was doing other things in his office. And in the old days, they used to have this thing called auto reverse. So when the cassette got to the end, it would start playing the other side. And that's when he heard human nature. And just how did a five-year-old inspire the song to be written in the first place? Toto was in the studio mixing our fourth album. Toto 4, creatively enough. I wanted to stop by and say hello to her at her mom's house before I went to the studio and met the guys, and my daughter Heather was very upset. She had had a real rough day at school. She had fallen off the slide, and a boy came up and hit her. And she was asked me why the boy came up and hit her. Trying to figure out how to explain to a five-year-old that, you know, he probably liked her in some way or just wanted to get her attention. And anyway, just the, just the title Human Nature, kind of the thought of human nature came, trying to explain human nature to a kid, you know, when she says why, you know. And uh, I went to the studio. The guys were, at, that night, they were in the booth mixing the song Africa. And um, I went out to the studio where the piano was and one sitting. First chords I wrote were... By the way, 
Steve Lukather has a book out called The Gospel According to Luke. It's a really good read and an even better listen in audiobook form. So if you're really into music, it's something you should really check out. Coming up, I'll talk about a recording session I wished I could have sat in on. The recording session I did with the artist that wrote and produced Lil Wayne's Lollipop, Stephen Static Major Garrett, and you'll hear a track that I produced for a local rock band several years ago, right after this. This is Mark Gunn Media. Hit it! Hey, what's up? This is Mark Gunn. I have an audiobook that I collaborated on with author Steve Dust Circle. It's called Before Your First Gig. It's written specifically for the new band or artist just getting started. In about 15 minutes, we will give you the blueprint for setting up to give live performances, marketing your band, and making your music presentable to the masses and the audience that you're going after. Thousands of dollars in sound advice for, get this, $3.99. That's right, $3.99. To download your copy, simply go to my my website markgunmedia.com that's markgunmedia.com and the link is on the home page it's available from audible itunes and amazon just click the link that you prefer as an added bonus with the proof of purchase i'll send you the mark gun media artist starter kit at no additional cost in it you'll find all the resources you need to learn about music licensing and publishing how to register your music with bds and SoundScan in order to get radio airplay there's also information about how to become a member of ascap and bds All the forms you need are included. And finally, the relationship between music and money. How you can cash in. Once you've downloaded your copy of Before Your First Gig, send me an email confirmation by going once again to the website markgunmedia.com and hit the Contact Us link. Just give me the name of one of the chapters you heard and any feedback about the book that you may have. And I will send you that artist starter kit. Thousands of dollars worth of information for just under $4. You won't find this anywhere else. Remember, go to markgunmedia.com and download before your first gig from the link on the homepage. Reach out with your proof of purchase by giving me the name of one of the chapters you heard. And the Mark Gun Media Artist Starter Kit is yours at no additional cost. Mark Gun Media. No hype, no hoopla, just damn good work. For downloads of this and past episodes and information about all the multimedia services we offer, log on to our website at www.markgunmedia.com. That's markgunmedia.com. Welcome back to Gunshot Straight from the Hip. I'm Mark Gunn. On this episode, Songs from the Studio Chair, My Life in Music, I'm taking a look back at the lifelong journey I've been on as a radio personality, musician, and producer. Now, before the break, I talked about some of the studio sessions for the Thriller album. I would have loved to have been a part of that energy. Another session I wished I could have been on happened back in 2014 with my all-time favorite band, Chicago. I crossed them off the bucket list when I met them years ago, and I still talk with some current and former members from time to time. Now, although the album didn't produce any hit singles, now marked the first new studio project in over five years. And the way it was done was pretty much state-of-the-art. Now, as you may know, the majority of music is recorded digitally these days, meaning you can record a record from just about anywhere. Gone for the most part are the days of the honking, massive 24-track recorders. And what Chicago did for now was to record it while on tour. Now, they developed and set up this mobile recording studio called The Rig, and they would record tracks out of their various hotel rooms and home studios. One of my favorite songs from that project was written by keyboardist Robert Lamb. It's called Naked in the Garden of Allah. Now, I managed to get a hold of the sessions done by the world-famous horn section. I'll play you some of that, and then I'll let you hear what it sounds like when it's all put together. One, two, three, four, five, five, five. Before the high C sharp, but oh ba bo ba bo Wait a 
Golly. That was great. We got a lot of it. That was Dude. so right on. I mean, That's like 90% of it. In 95%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just... Now here's the finished horn arrangement. is what I love about producing music, putting all the individual pieces together to make the whole. In all the time that I've been doing this, there have been two recording sessions that are nearest and dearest to my heart from an emotional standpoint. The first is where the instrumental that you just heard came from. The band is Lotus Blake, and they were based here in Louisville. I was introduced to this four-piece unit by their former manager during one of their live shows. They were young musicians who had no idea just how good they really were. And after months and months of more live shows, I wanted to take them into the studio to record a demo EP. Now, they had had one other experience that didn't go so well because the guy they were working with, quite frankly, didn't have a clue. What I loved about working with Lotus Blake in the project they called Illuminati was I had a chance to vibe with an engineer I'd never worked with before, but we had an almost instant chemistry. Now, he would do things in the mix just as I was thinking of them, so we didn't have to talk a whole lot. As for the band, it was like another day at the office. The advantage they had was the fact that they played live a lot. So except for a few arrangement changes and some additional coaching, the project came out just as expected. I even had a little fun doing background vocals on a couple of the songs. My favorite song from Illuminati was a little gem called Not To Be A Fool.
While Illuminati was an incredible project to be a part of, my all-time favorite recording session brought my radio world together with my musical world in a way that will never, ever be duplicated. When I came to Louisville, it was to become the afternoon drive personality and eventually the program director for WGZB-FM. It's B96.5. I figured I would need a theme song for my show that would give me a chance to use my skills as a writer. The band Mint Condition has always been an inspiration to me, and they were the inspiration for my theme song, and it meant the world to me to get their stamp of approval on it a few years later. I wrote the lyrics and recorded an early version that I only played a few times. During my time in Louisville, I was introduced to a young man who became a little brother to me, and one of the most important people in my life. Stephen Static Major Garrett. Yeah, that Static Major. The same one who wrote massive hits for Aaliyah, Timbaland, Rihanna, Lil Wayne, and so many more. This Grammy Award winning, well-loved and well-respected musical juggernaut is my friend. Now, our relationship was such that I earned his trust and respect. One of the lessons that I learned from Quincy Jones. This man, who's written all of these major hits, one of the most prolific songwriters in the industry, would ask me for my opinion about his music. There were so many days that we would ride around Louisville listening to some of the most incredible music that you'll probably never get to hear. And that's a damn shame. Now, if I had one beef with Steve, it was that sometimes he didn't know when to say when when he was working on a particular song. I used to be that way, so I'd have to pull him back and make him walk away for a bit. I don't know how many times I've said to him, Dude, it's done. Now, I'd performed with Static a few times over the years. Nothing serious, just some impromptu stage stuff. So a running joke we had was that he was going to put me on one of his projects. Mind you, I'm an okay singer, but a better producer. So the thought of actually working with Static Major is a different type of intimidating. Little did I know, and remember the theme song I mentioned a little bit earlier? Well, during one of his visits to the radio station, I got the idea to do a remix featuring Static on vocals. Figured it wouldn't hurt to ask, knowing how busy he was with other projects. This wonderful man with one of the most beautiful spirits I'd ever known says, Bet, let's go to my studio right now. Okay, so I'm officially doing a song with Static Major. It'll never be played outside of Louisville, and it'll never be released as a record. But we're doing this anyway. Now, Steve is one of the most efficient collaborators and producers I've ever worked with, period. I laid down my lead vocals for the verses and the chorus, and Steve put down his harmonies, an incredible process in and of itself. Now, while he was doing that, I had an idea for a verse that I wanted him to do the lead and background vocals for. I wrote it, about five minutes, gave him the lyrics, sang the lead vocal once, and he murdered it on the first take. Now, the song that took me two days to write and produce was done in the space of an hour. This, among so many things, is why this is my all-time favorite recording session. I humbly present to you the gun theme, featuring Steve Static Major Garrett. My man Static's on the track. More gun is on the mic, right? It's never waxed, so it's gonna be tight, right? Yeah, I'm putting it down, doing this radio thing. <laughs> Check it out, Mark Gun's about Mark to Gun's sign. about to sign, sign, sign. It's sign. the middle of the day, you're still at work. Looking at your boss, your man, he's still a jerk. Jerk. Getting through your day and staring at the clock. What time, what time is it? Five o'clock's coming and you know it's time to rock. I gotta go, gotta bounce. You See worked ya. hard all day and you know it won't be long. How long? Now we long. got what you need to keep you going strong. Uh huh. Yeah. Keep yourself together, play in your position. Mark Gun is in the house to handle your condition. All the colors yeah, 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 yeah. What Mark brings to the party's got it going on. What Mark brings to the party's getting you on your way home. What Mark brings to the party's keeping you in the mix. Mark gonna be afternoon on B96. Point five, baby! You get to your car and now you're on the run. Hit the water. 
person a traffic jam no fun but it's all right cause i've got you in the mix, in the mix, in the mix smart now. gun is on the box so you know what time it is hey, oh what mark brings to the party's got it going on got got it going on, on. What Mark brings to the party's get you on your way home. Getting you on your way home. What Mark brings to the party's keeping you in the mix. What gonna be afternoon on B96. What Mark brings to the party's got it going on. Got it going on. What Mark brings to the party's get you on your way home. Getting you on your way home. What Mark brings to the party's keeping you in the mix. Hip hop and R&B in the home of the Russ Farm Morning Show. Mark up with my man Static. Keep it locked, it won't be long until you hear your favorite song. Five seven one B nine six five. That's the way we keep it live. Keep it locked, it won't be long until you hear your favorite song. Five seven one B nine six five. That's the way you keep it live. West Paw in the morning. Mark Gunn in the afternoon. Louisville. Speed 96.5. Again, I have to thank Stokely Williams and the members of Mint Condition for giving me their nod of approval for the rhythm track of that song. If there's one thing I love about the music industry, it's that relationships, just like the music, can last forever. Thank you for indulging me in my trip down memory lane. You've been listening to Gunshots Straight from the Hip. The views expressed are those of the host and guests and not reflective of any business entity or anyone associated with this broadcast. If you have any comments or want more information on how to be a sponsor, log on to our website at markgunmedia.com or call us at 502-407-0283. That's 502-407-0283. Thank you for listening. Mark Gun Media. No hype, no hoopla. Just damn good work.